Oh, good evening. And on this episode, uh, I'd like to talk about the Trinity. Um, now, I read quite a few books on the Trinity, either from a theological perspective or from an historical point of view, historical theology, the development of the doctrine of the Trinity, or from a philosophical point of view. People like John Hick and uh, philosophers have looked at the doctrine. But And um, one book stands out as just amazing, just uh, the book I would recommend. If you want a brilliant critique of the doctrine of the Trinity from a Christian position, um, and it's a book um, authored by a chap called William Ellery Channing. Now, it's likely that you've never heard of this guy. And indeed, I hadn't heard of him either until his name was mentioned and recommended by Tim Winter, the Muslim scholar at Cambridge University, who recommended this volume I've got, which is his selected writings. Who was William Ellery Channing? Well, he was born in 1780, and um, he is known as the foremost Unitarian preacher in the United States. Uh, and one of the greatest um, theologians as well. And uh, he died uh, in 1842. Um, and he was simply an amazing preacher and uh, theologian. Uh, and his writing certainly stands the test of time. It's written in a, a 19th century kind of way. And it takes a little bit of getting used to his writing style, which is not really the writing style of uh, people in the 21st century but nevertheless it's it's quite readable in fact his prose is brilliant um, I just wanted to read to you a little bit an extract from uh, his collective writings um, this is an old second-hand copy it doesn't even, even have a cover on it so it's a bit battered and old and that's all I can get my hands on but I'll put a link to the book in uh, underneath the video if you'd want to get it so in terms of the book recommendations for a really top-notch, sophisticated critique of the doctrine of the Trinity from a Christian theologian. Um, this is the best, uh, and it's probably not the most readable, but it really repays the effort. So I'll just read uh, a portion of it to you and make of it what you will. Um, if you don't like it, that's fine. Not everyone's a cup of tea. Um, so uh, um, this is just starting on page 78. I mean, there's, there's so much in this book. Um, it's what, 300 pa over 300 pages long. So this is almost sort of random. And he says, we object to the doctrine of the Trinity that whilst acknowledging in words, it subverts in effect the unity of God. Now Channing is a big believer in the unity of God as are Jews, as are uh, Muslims, obviously. According to this doctrine, uh, the doctrine of the Trinity, there are three infinite and equal persons possessing supreme divinity called the Father, Son and Holy Ghost. Each of these persons, as described by theologians, has his own particular consciousness, will and perceptions. They love each other, converse with each other and delight in each other's society. They perform different parts in man's redemption, each having his appropriate office and neither doing the work of the other. The son is mediator and not the father. The father sends the son and is not himself sent, nor is he conscious like the son of taking flesh. Here, then, we have three intelligent agents possessed of three consciousnesses, different wills, and different perceptions, performing different acts and sustaining different relations. And if these things do not imply and constitute three minds or beings, we are utterly at a loss to know how three minds or beings are to be formed. It is difference of properties and acts and consciousness which leads us to the belief of different intelligent beings. And if this mark fails us, our whole knowledge fails. We have no proof that all the agents and persons in the universe are not one and the same mind. When we attempt to conceive of three gods, we can do nothing more than represent to ourselves three agents, distinguished from each other by similar marks and peculiarities to those which separate the persons of the Trinity. And when common Christians hear these persons spoken of as conversing with each other, loving each other, performing different acts, how can they help regarding them as different beings, different minds? We do then with all earnestness 
though without reproaching our brethren, protest against the irrational and unscriptural doctrine of the Trinity. To us, as the apostle and primitive and the primitive Christians, there is one God, even the Father. That's actually a quote from the Bible. To us, there is one God, even the Father. That's in the New Testament. With Jesus, we worship the Father as the only living and true God. We are astonished that any man can read the New Testament and avoid the conviction that the Father alone is God. We hear our Saviour continually appropriating this character to the Father. We find the Father continually distinguished from Jesus by the title, God sent his Son. God anointed Jesus. Now, how singular and inexplicable is this phraseology which fills the New Testament if this title belonged equally to Jesus? And if a principal object of this book is to reveal him as God, as partaking equally with the Father in supreme divinity? We challenge our opponents to adduce one passage in the New Testament where one word God means three persons, where it is not limited to one person and where, unless turned from its usual sense by the connection, it does not mean the Father. Can any stronger proof be given that the doctrine of three persons in the Godhead is not a fundamental doctrine of Christianity? So I think that's an excellent point. Where does it say in the New Testament that God means Father, Son and Holy Spirit, three equal gods? Of course, it doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. He continues, this doctrine, were it true, must, from its difficulty, singularity and importance, have been laid down with great clearness, guarded with great care and stated with all possible precision. But where does this statement appear? So he's saying, if this doctrine of the Trinity was so fundamental to Christianity, it would be stated very clearly. But he says, where does it appear? From the many passages which treat of God, we ask for one, uh, one only in which we are told that he is a threefold being, or that he is three persons, or that he is Father, Son and Holy Ghost. On the contrary, in the New Testament, where at least we might expect many express assertions of this nature, God is declared to be one without the least attempt to prevent the acceptance of the words in their common sense. And he is always spoken of and addressed in the singular number, that is, in language which was universally understood to intend a single person and to which no other idea could have been attached without an expressed admonition. So entirely do the scriptures abstain from stating the Trinity, that when our opponents would insert it into the creeds and doxologies, they are compelled to leave the Bible and to invent forms of words altogether unsanctioned by scriptural phraseology. I think what he has in mind here is the famous Council of Nicaea in AD 325, which coined new terms like homoousion, which means of the same being or the same substance when uh, characterizing the relation between the father and the son. This is not biblical language, of course. It's the language from pagan philosophy. That a doctrine so strange, so liable to misapprehension, so fundamental as this is said to be and requiring such careful exposition should be left so undefined and unprotected to be made, to be made out by inference and to be hunted through distant and detached parts of scripture. This is a difficulty which we think no ingenuity can explain. So he's kind of accusing the Trinitarians here of picking bits from the Bible and putting them together in their minds to produce this doctrine, but it's not stated itself uh, in the scriptures. And then he comes across an, another difficulty, and this is um, a difficulty which is not often mentioned. Uh, it's a very powerful uh, objection to the doctrine of the Trinity. It's quite clever, very clever. He says, we have another difficulty. Christianity, it must be remembered, was planted and grew up amidst sharp-sighted enemies 
who overlooked no objectionable part of the system and who must have fastened with great earnestness on a doctrine involving such apparent contradictions as the Trinity. We cannot conceive an opinion against which the Jews, who prided themselves on adherence to God's unity, would have raised an equal clamour. Now, how happens it that the apostolic writings, in other words, Paul's letters, James, John, etc., Peter, which relate so much to objections against Christianity, so they often are uh, dealing with objections, rebutting them, criticizing them. It so happens that in the apostolic writings, which relate so much to objections against Christianity and to the controversies which grew out of this religion, not one word is said, implying that objections were brought against the gospel from the doctrine of the Trinity. Not one word is uttered in its defense and explanation, not a word to rescue it from reproach and mistake. This argument has almost the force of demonstration. So if this was the belief of the first Christians, the doctrine of the Trinity, how come uh, there is no trace of controversy about it in the Jewish polemic um, against Christians? Surely there would have been uh, a, a great deal of polemic about it and it would have been reflected in the debates arguments and defenses of the faith the the apologies the apologetics that we find in the new testament but there's no trace of this anywhere he says this argument has almost the force of demonstration we are persuaded that had three divine persons been announced by the first preachers of christianity all equal and all infinite, one of whom was the very Jesus who had lately died on a cross, this peculiarity of Christianity would have almost absorbed every other, and the great labour of the apostles would have been to repel the continual assaults which it would have awakened. But the fact is that not a whisper of objection to Christianity on that account reaches our ears from the apostolic age. In the epistles, we see not a trace of controversy called forth by the Trinity. Now, this kind of argument from silence is still very powerful, and it suggests um, that the Trinity, of course, wasn't taught by the apostles at all. Otherwise, it would have brought forth this ap apologetic defense against inevitable criticisms from Jews. Um, now, he goes on to state further objections to this doctrine of the Trinity. And I'll read just one or two more, but uh, um, this book is full of them and uh, they're very sophisticated, as you can see, and subtle, and I find them compelling. We have further objections to this doctrine drawn from its practical influence. And he's talking about the life of the Christian believer, uh, particularly when they pray and, and they're in their relationship to the Trinity and the confusion this generates. We regard it as unfavorable to devotion, by diverting and distracting the mind in its communion with God. It is a great excellence of the doctrine of the unity of God's unity that it offers us one object of supreme homage, adoration, and love. So you're praying and worshipping one God, one infinite Father, one being, one original and fountain to whom we may refer all good in whom all our powers and affections may be concentrated and whose lovely and venerable nature may pervade all our thoughts. True piety, when directed to an undivided trinity, has a chasteness, a singleness, most favourable to religious awe and love. This is a very 19th century way, but I quite like it, quite flowery, quite, um, quite poetic in a way. Now, the Trinity sets before us three distinct objects of supreme adoration, three infinite persons, each having equal claims on our hearts, three agents, three divine agents, performing different offices and to, to, and to be acknowledged and worshipped in different relations. And is it possible, we ask, that the weak and limited mind of man can attach itself to these with the same power and joy as to one infinite father, the only first cause in whom all the blessings of nature and redemption meet as their center and source? Must not devotion be distracted by the equal and rival claims of three equal persons? 
and must not the worship of the conscientious, consistent Christian be disturbed by an apprehension, lest he withhold one from one or another of these his due proportion of homage. Wow. And I remember as a Christian thinking, well, you know, who do I pray to? Am I praying to Jesus? Or am I praying to the Father or, or to the Holy Spirit? And of course, if you're a Catholic and most Christians in the world or well, the biggest church in the world is Catholic. You also have other entities to pray to, Mary principally, but also all the other saints, and then they're the angels. So it's quite a pantheon of quasi divinities or actual divinities. Um, I remember one Christian friend of mine saying to me that it, it this kind of faith resembled uh, Hinduism, with again with this pantheon of deities, an unkind thought, but nevertheless, I know what he means. Uh, so he continues, William Ellery Channing continues. We also think that the doctrine of the Trinity injures devotion, not only by joining to the Father other objects of worship, but by taking from the Father the supreme affection, which is his due, and transferring it to the Son. Now, this is really an accusation of idolatry, jesus idolatry, as someone called it. This is a most important view, he says, that Jesus Christ, if exalted into the infinite divinity, should be more interesting than the Father. It's precisely what we might what might be expected from history and for the principles of human nature. And this game is, is a fascinating insight. Men want an object of worship like themselves. And the great secret of idolatry lies in this propensity. A God clothed in our form, feeling our wants and sorrows, speaks to our weak nature more strongly than a father in heaven, a pure spirit, invisible and unapproachable, save by the reflecting and purifying mind. We think, too, that the peculiar offices ascribed to Jesus by the popular theology make him the most attractive person in the Godhead. The Father is the depository of justice, the vindicator of rights, the avenger of laws, uh, of the divinity. On the other hand, the Son, the brightness of the divine mercy, stands between the incensed deity and guilty humanity, exposes his meek head to the storms and his compassionate breast to the sword of divine justice, bears our whole load of punishment and purchases with his blood every blessing which descends from heaven. We need, need we state the effect of these representations, especially on common minds for whom Christianity was chiefly designed and to whom it seeks to bring to the Father as the loveliest being. We do believe that the worship of a bleeding, suffering God tends to, to strongly absorb the human mind and to draw it from other objects, just as the human tenderness of the Virgin Mary has given her so conspicuous a place in the devotions of the Church of Rome. And talking about the bleeding, suffering God, and of course it's one can go further and talk about the God who needs to use the toilet and the God who was weak and the God who doesn't know things, as Jesus says he doesn't know things in, in the Gospels. Um, so it's, it's a, a God who's really reduced to a human, fallible, weak level. We believe, too, that this worship, though attractive, he says, is not most fitted to spiritualize the mind, that it awakens human transport rather than that deep veneration of the moral perfections of God, which is the essence of piety. And uh, last, well, he goes on now and talks about the the unity of jesus christ uh, having one mind one soul one being and how that is um broken by the doctrine of the trinities so i'm not going to go into that because we one can go i can go on forever this is just such great stuff so I, I i do recommend this book uh if you can negotiate the language if you can overcome it get used to it go with the flow um it becomes a uh, uh, good strong meat for the mind to digest and there are many amazing arguments here uh, i might mention some others on a separate video um which really penetrate to the doctrine of the trinity and it show how incoherent and unreasonable and irrational and unbefitting it is to 
a belief in the unity of God, which after all is the belief of Abraham, the belief of Moses, the belief of Jesus, the belief of Muhammad, all the, the prophets of God. So um, I hope that is of some interest to you. Thank you.